and introduce um, Jackie Bennett with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries to get us started. Thanks, Robin, and welcome everyone. I'm Jackie Bennett. I am the Program Director for Africa and Asia for the uh, Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, or GFAS. Tomorrow is Endangered Species Day, and we're celebrating one day early by presenting our webinar, Protecting Endangered Species, a Vital Role of Sanctuaries. Let me get to the slide, okay. So I know some of you are familiar with GFAS, but I'm just gonna take a moment to tell you a bit about our mission and work. We like to say that GFAS helps sanctuaries to help animals. GFAS has a global accreditation program recognizing true sanctuaries and rescue centers that meet high standards in animal care and operations, including those caring for wildlife, equines, and farmed animals. But part of our mission is to raise awareness of the important work of sanctuaries. Sanctuaries provide safe haven to animals that come into captivity for a variety of reasons, and they may be a permanent home or provide temporary care. But they do much more. They educate the public about why sanctuaries are needed and the root causes that bring animals into captivity. They are vital to the advocacy efforts that bring about change to not only improve the lives of captive animals, but also to protect species in the wild. And they work together with their communities for the conservation of these species and their habitats. Now, if you'd like to learn about more of our GFS certified sanctuaries, I invite you to visit our website and view the map at sanctuaryfederation.org slash find dash a dash sanctuary. Uh, many of these sanctuaries do care for endangered species, including great apes, big cats, elephants, and more. But today we will hear from speakers from three exceptional sanctuaries. For the Longway Wildlife Center in Malawi, part of the Lilongwe Wildlife Trust, takes in over 100 orphaned and injured animals each year. And among those animals increasingly are pangolins. We are joined today by Tori Kersmith, the head of wildlife rehabilitation for the Lilongwe Wildlife Trust. Tori has been with the trust for three years and has a background in veterinary nursing and zookeeping. And in just the brief conversation I had with Tori leading up to this webinar, I learned a lot about how challenging it is to rehabilitate penguins. And Tori's gonna to tell us a lot more about this today. Grace Sanctuary at the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo cares for 14 critically endangered growers gorillas. Grace describes its work as a future for gorillas built on community. And this is exemplified not only by the care of captive gorillas, but also Grace's involvement in community-led conservation efforts to protect wild gorilla populations. With us today is Grace's program director, Dr. Katie Fawcett. Katie has a PhD in zoology and has spent much of her career living and working in Central Asia and Africa, including 10 years with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, directing their mountain gorilla research, education, and protection programs in Rwanda. And when we talk about endangered species, we might typically think about pangolins or apes or maybe tigers, but we might not think about birds. And so we are very happy to be able to highlight the work of foster parrots. Foster Parrots is the largest avian rescue organization in the Northeast United States. And it also partners with organizations working elsewhere to protect the freedom of parrots in the wild. Joining us today to discuss Foster Parrots work is Tanika Oriel Norway, who is also joined by Foster Parrots Executive Director, Karen Windsor. Tanika has a long history with, history with Foster Parrots, formerly as Chief Operations Officer and currently as Executive Advisor and Board Treasurer. Tanika is also currently the Country Director of Four Paws USA. She has a Master in Public Policy from the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts, where she focused on issues of wildlife in captivity and human animal conflict. Now, just as another reminder, we'll have time for question and answer at the end of the presentation, but feel free to submit your questions as we go and we'll get to them later. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Tori for the first presentation to tell us about work with penguins. Amazing, hi everyone. Um, just give me one moment. Can you all see this? Looks great, we can see them. 
Awesome, cool. So as uh, Jackie mentioned, I am going to be talking to you a bit today about the work that we do with pangolins in Malawi um, and the rescue and the rehab and everything that goes into looking after pangolins as a species. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm the head of wildlife rehabilitation here at the Wildlife Centre. Um, so one of of the many roles that comes under my job description is to manage the pangolin program. Uh, so I will give you guys a bit of an insight into what that looks like for us as a centre. Um, so a bit of an overview. So pangolins are one of the world's most trafficked non-human animals. Um, and one of the biggest things is that not many people even know what a pangolin is. Um, so we're losing these animals at a really alarming rate before the world's even had a chance to work out that they existed in the first place. Um, so one of the, the big things that we have to do before we can even start to combat the trade is just to educate people about what on earth is actually a pangolin. Um, so there's eight species of pangolin worldwide. There's four in Africa and four in Asia. All of the pangolin species across the world are thought to be in decline. The Asian species are all listed as critically or in, sorry, endangered or critically endangered. Um, the trade in Asia in pangolins has been going on for years uh, and has really decimated the population over there. And now that the trade in Asia is kind of reaching a point where there just aren't any pangolins anymore for them to find, that trade is now moving to Africa. Um, so we've seen the effects of the trade um, kind of building up and up. And in the last maybe five, 10 years, it's just got completely out of hand. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but just a bit of a background on pangolins. So, so they only eat ants and termites, which makes them very difficult to care for. Um, and they don't have any teeth and they don't have a voice box, which also makes them incredibly easy to traffic, unfortunately, because you can put them in a backpack, you can transport them on a public minibus and nobody even knows it's there. It doesn't make a noise, it just curls up in a ball and it just sits there quietly. Um, so that's one of the, the big things that we're fighting against um, is that these little guys just can't even speak for themselves, even if they tried. Um, so it's really, it's really quite sad. Um, just a bit of a background of pangolins in Malawi. Um, so in Malawi, we work with the Temenix ground pangolin, also sometimes referred to as a cape pangolin. They're the only bipedal species of pangolin. Um, so they walk on their hind legs with their tail and their front limbs up in the air, um, and they are solely terrestrial. Uh, most of the Asian species and a few of the other African species are arboreal, um, that is they live in trees, but ours live entirely on the ground. They're too heavy to get up into the tree. They are solitary, although we are seeing now in some of our post-release monitoring that we're doing, um, that some of the pangolins that we have put sat tags on are actually sharing territories. Um, so they don't seem to interact within those territories, but they are coming across each other, oops, sorry, <laughs> um, during their day. Um, so they're nocturnal as adults. Um, when they're juveniles, they hang around during the day a bit more, and that's part of predator control. So as an adult, they're covered in these really, really thick scales and there isn't very much that can get through them. As a juvenile, those scales are a lot thinner um, and can be munched through. So the adults come out at night, they don't have to worry about lions, leopards, hyenas, they're pretty safe. Whereas the juveniles come out during the day when those large carnivores are sleeping and it's a bit safer for them to move around. Uh, pangolins generally give birth to one pup a year um, and usually around September, October, that baby's born. Um, you can see in this photo, this is how the mothers transport their babies once they're big enough. They just kind of cling on to their backs um, and mum goes along and doing her foraging with the baby sitting on her back like that. So pangolins and the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so as I mentioned, pangolins are the world's most trafficked non-human animal. The international commercial trade in pangolins was banned in 2016, um, but that doesn't seem to have made a very big difference to the level at which these animals are trafficked. Um, so more than a million pangolins were trafficked between 2000 and 2014, according to the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Group Traffic. Um, and I think that number's probably doubled since then. Um, the trade has just gone completely out of hand. Um, as I mentioned, the trade in Asia has been going on for years. In Africa, it's, it's a fairly recent problem for us. So here at the Wildlife Centre, um, I'll go into it a little bit later, we've only really been working with pangolins properly for about four years now. Um, but in that four years, the number of pangolins that we're seeing come through the center has skyrocketed. Um, and it's really quite scary just how quickly these animals are coming into the trade. Um, so in uh, parts of Central and West Africa, they're making uh, arrests of people who have two or 300 tons of pangolin scales at a time, which represents hundreds of individual animals. Um, so for a species that only rep reproduces once a year, that the, the numbers that are involved in the trade is, is really, really scary. So the pangolin trade in Malawi, our first recorded pangolin came through in 2017. Um, we had two animals recorded through the trade in that year. 
And then you'll see in 2019, we had six through the center. 2020, we had 24. 2021, that number jumped to 33. And so far in 2022, we've had 12 pangolins come through already. And it's currently considered down season for pangolins. Um, the pangolin trade usually peaks for us around October, December. Um, and during those months, we tend to see at least one pangolin a week coming through the center. So the fact that we're already at 12 and we're not even in peak season is, is not good. Uh, but we are working um, as best we can to try and stop that trade. So we have, um, I'll get to it a little bit later, but we do have some law enforcement teams. We have a wildlife detection dog unit that we've just recently formed. Um, and we have a huge criminal justice unit, which are working to increase the penalties for pangolin trafficking to try and de-incentivize um, the trade. So as I said, a large number of animals that we get in Malawi actually coming through Mozambique. Um, so Zimbabwe and South Africa are seeing the same thing, that the animals are being captured in Mozambique and then filtered across the borders and out of the country through those neighboring countries. We're not sure of the exact reason for this, um, but it, it's huge. Um, I would say probably close to 70% of the pangolins that we get through the Wildlife Center started life in Mozambique. Um, they're transported in all sorts of homemade sacks. So in Hessian sacks, in backpacks, in jerry cans, in homemade metal cages. Um, so you can see these two photos are two of our recent arrivals. The top one here um, has been stuffed into a maize bag. So that would have had uh, corn in it previously. Um, and then they've thrown the pangolin in. The next one below has had a jerry can, a hole cut in the top of a jerry can um, and the pangolin forced inside. When pangolins are scared, they curl up into a really tight ball. So what people do is they frighten them, the pangolins curl up in the ball and they're able to stuff that ball into um, any number of, of homemade devices and then try and get them out of the country as any way they can. So here at the Lalongwe Wildlife Centre, we're currently the only facility in Malawi that is able to provide um, care for pangolins from intake to release. There's a couple of other teams who are doing kind of bits and pieces of that story, uh, but we're generally the only ones who do the whole A to Z, um, which is a lot of work. So we have a fully equipped hospital on site and we have a team of five staff who work primarily on pangolins. Um, so that's all they do day in, day out is pangolin rehabilitation. So you can see, um, this is an example of one of the pangolins that's come through to us. You can see how very thin that animal is. So you can see um, along the, the belly line there, that should be a nice round, smooth lump. The scale should match the skin neatly. But what you can see in that photo is that it is concave. Those scales have a huge gap between them and the skin. And that's just how critically underweight this animal is. Um, so pangolins can survive for between two and three weeks without food. So sometimes when we get these animals in, they haven't eaten for weeks. Um, they haven't had access to water. They've been in a tight ball stuffed in a bag in the corner of someone's house for weeks and weeks before we get them to us. Um, so a large number of the pangolins that come into the center do look like this. This is a fairly common intake scenario for us, an animal that is just on starvation um, death's door. So what we do next is we developed a bit of a scoring system and that helps us to work out where the animal fits in the rehab story. So does it need lots of extra care or is it an animal that just needs a day or two and can go back out into the wild? So there's a couple of factors that we look for. We look for weight, we look for how the animal is moving. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, they're bipedal. They should have their tail up and their feet up and be walking kind of like a banana shape. As soon as we see that tail touch the ground, we know that there's something wrong with that animal um, and it probably needs some medical care. So that's an animal that we would need to keep for a while. Um, and then one of the difficult things about the pangolins that we get through is because they've come through the trade, they're part of really complex court cases. So before we can even begin rehabilitating a pangolin, it has to go to court and we need to be given a release order for that animal. Um, so that can be really, really tricky. Sometimes it's weighing up what we know the pangolin needs versus what we can get the legal authority to do. Um, so that's a whole thing. Uh, I mean, for me, myself, something that I was absolutely not used to. I wasn't used to animals that had this whole other world around them. We're used to getting primate intakes where basically the animal comes in it's in our care, we look after it, everything's fine. Uh, but with these pangolins, there's court cases, there's lawyers, there's a whole lot of stuff involved that just makes it really, really complicated. We also get a lot of young animals coming in that we need to keep in care to help them grow and develop. So these guys would stay with their mum until they're roughly five, six kilos. So we don't release them until they're at least that six kilo mark. Um, and we're getting animals, our smallest animal that ever came through weighed 400 grams. 
Um, so sometimes we have to keep them for quite a long time. So as Jackie mentioned earlier, pangolins are incredibly difficult to care for. They only eat ants and termites, and each individual pangolin will have their very specific personal choices about what ants they want to eat. So it's not as simple as just finding any random nest, putting your pangolin on and off you go. You've got to find the species of ant that that specific pangolin wants to eat, uh, which sometimes can take a really long time. Um, we also can't bring ants to the pangolin. They have to find them themselves. So these pangolins have to be taken out into the bush for forage walks. Um, so sometimes our carers are out for four or five hours a night just walking these animals through the bush, trying to find enough food for them. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of work. Um, young pangolins, being a mammal, also need milk. So you can see here, this is little elf. He came in at Christmas last year, um, drinking his bottle. Um, and so the milk that we get them is uh, Royal Cannon kitten milk. We can't get it in Malawi. So we import it at about 80 US dollars a bottle. So to raise a baby pangolin for milk on three months cost us a couple of hundred US dollars um, just before we've even taken in staff costs and all of that. So it's quite a big operation to get these things back on their feet. We've recently been able to start doing some post-release monitoring for our pangolins, which has been really, really cool. Um, so we've got a number of satellite tags that we can fit on these animals and see what they're doing. There's very little research about pangolins out there at the moment. Um, nobody knows what they do, um, especially in Malawi. Nobody's done any long-term research projects before. So by putting these tags on them, we're able to see what's happening with these animals post-release and has shown us a lot of things that we really didn't expect. Um, so we're finding a lot of new information about their home ranges, the fact that the females do actually overlap, um, which contradicts some of the science that's out there at the moment. Um, so it's really cool that we're seeing that sort of thing. Um, we're also doing some diet studies to find out if pangolins will adjust their ant species based on the time of the year um, and all of that sort of stuff. So I wanted to end today with just two little stories about pangolins that have come through our care and made it out the other side. So this little dude is Billy. So you can see his crazy long tongue there. So pangolins tongues actually affix on their pelvic bone and run the full length of their body. So they can stick their tongue out almost double their body length to try and get ants. Um, they can also move that tongue through holes. Um, so you can watch them eating at one hole and their tongue will pop up, you know, five or 10 centimeters somewhere else out of the ground. Um, so they're very cool little tongues. So Billy is a juvenile male. He arrived at about three and a half kilos, which makes him somewhere between nine, 10 months old. Um, and he had a severe snare wound to his right arm. So you can see in this photo, we actually had to amputate his arm. Um, so it's obviously a major surgery for a little guy. But he did incredibly well. And I'll show you in a video in the next slide. The night of his surgery, he was back out foraging, eating and doing everything. So these guys are incredibly resilient animals. Um, so he was in care with us for seven months. We released him in May this year. He was 6.6 .6 kilos on release. And our team were able to find him a few weeks ago on the 7th of April, and he weighed 8.2 kilos. Um, so even with one arm, he's doing incredibly well for himself um, and has managed to put on you know, almost two kilos in the time that he's been out there. So we're very proud of our little one-armed Billy. Um, so this is a video, you can see him, sorry, it's not a great video, but you can see him foraging. So they dig with those front limbs to break into the ant nests um, and use those really long tongues to get in there um, and get all the ants. So this was the night of his surgery and he was back out there foraging. Um, so we're very, very proud of him. And this is just him moving along. So you can see, um, he's a juvenile, so he still uses his arm sometimes, but you can see how that tail is way up in the air, and that just shows that he is uh, doing really well and that he's feeling good. So he's a fast little boy. <laughs> One of our other notable cases that we had through is Peggy. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see in this photo, but Peggy arrived with basically missing the lower half of one of her legs. Um, so you can see that's her uh, shin bone and... Um, basically with all of her leg bones exposed in the bottom there. So that's a snare wound that she would have been living with for quite some time because um, all the skin had started to dry already. Um, and she'd obviously received no medical care for that while she was in the tray. So again, unfortunately in her case, our only option was to amputate that leg. Um, and she was then with us for another five months, putting on weight and recovering from that wound. And then she was able to be released. Um, so as I mentioned, they are a bipedal species of pangolin. So walking with one leg, we were really worried how she was going to get around because she obviously, she can't hop, it's 12 kilos worth of animal. So she needed to find a way to get around on her own. Um, and what you can see in this video is that she worked it out really quickly. So Peggy worked out how to walk with her tail. Um, so you can see every step where she would use her uh, alternate leg, she curls up her tail. And we didn't teach her this, she learned this all by herself. 
Um, she was doing this within a few days after her surgery. She just worked out that she'd need to be creative if she wanted to get around. Um, and yeah, we were able to release her, which was really, really cool um, to see an animal that had come in so badly injured, um, but was able to recover and head back out into the wild. Um, so, you know, for all the sadness of the trade, we do have um, quite a few success stories and quite a few animals like Peggy and Billy that were able to get back out into the wild. Um, and that's what makes it all worth it. Um, so there's some things you guys can do to help. One of them is adopt a pangolin through our Lalongwe Wildlife Adoption Campaign. And that helps us pay for things like pangolin staff, satellite tags, field costs, veterinary costs, all of the costs that go into raising a pangolin. Um, so this is one of our young pangolins. This is the one that came in at 400 grams. Um, this is her when she's just about ready to go for release. She's having a little mud bath. So pangolins can swim. Um, they really like to roll around in the mud. They like to roll around in poop. Um, but this is her having a little bath in the evening one day. So they are very cute little creatures. And so, yeah, that's kind of uh, a bit of a brief introduction on pangolins in Malawi. So. Um, hopefully you guys at least now know what a pangolin is, as long as we can get everyone to know what they are. That's the first step to saving them. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Tori. And I'll add that the Longway Wildlife Trust website has a lot more information about their work uh, to protect pangolins and their campaigns um, combating the wildlife trade. Um, and I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat as we go along. Um, so take a look if you want to learn more about those issues. But next, we're going to turn to gorillas and hear from Dr. Katie Fawcett talking about Grace's work. Thank you very much, Jackie. And thank you very much, Tori. That was fascinating. Um, can everybody see my screen OK? It looks good. Great. Well, thank you again, Jackie, for the opportunity to be here and share about our, um, our work at, at, at GRACE. And the, the topic was something that was really, um, um, what would you say, really hit home to us because we really see that the work that we do at the GRACE Sanctuary is really at the crossroads of animal welfare and, and conservation. So if we just start um, with a little overview of our vision and our mission at GRACE. Um, GRACE, the sanctuary has been rooted in conservation right from the very, very, very beginning. It's a spin-off from the well-known organization, um, Dime Fossey Gorilla Fund, and it came as a direct request from national and regional, regional law enforcement agencies to help these agencies to address the illegal wildlife trade. So without a home for for gorillas, um, it was very difficult to actually be um, enforcing um, uh, the law and illegal trade. And also central to our mission from the beginning that's in our name, GRACE, Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education, is that sanctuary and conservation education programs have gone hand in hand right from the very beginning. So our vision is a healthy, stable population of wild growers, gorillas in, in DRC that's no longer threatened and a source of pride for the Congolese people. And our mission is to provide excellent care for rescued growers, gorillas, and work alongside Congolese communities to promote the conservation of wild gorillas in their habitat. And I'll just take you through how we're doing, how we achieve this. First of all, we're right in the center, in the green heart of Africa, the warm heart of Africa, we like to say. Um, and Along the, if we, the it's kind of the backbone of Africa, the Albertine Rift. Here we're found just to the east, uh, sorry, to the west of Virunga National Park that we might know, near the boundary border of Uganda, Rwanda, and where we are in Eastern DRC. And I put this map up here. We can see the the green national parks are home for the Grauish gorillas, and you can see we're based here near, near the. Uh, Taina Gorilla Nature Reserve, Grace is just here. And what's important is that it's a very remote location, but it's also right in the heart of wild gorilla habitat. 
and, and why gorilla conservation matters. Grouse gorillas are critically endangered. Um, they live in this Afro-Montane biodiversity hotspot, an area where lots of wildlife, and I'm really excited, Tori, to know more about pangolin. Um, lots of endemic wildlife in this region too. It, but it's also an area of extreme poverty and conservation really brings stability to these remote regions and helps to uplift the local communities. Um, we're in the middle of the Congo Basin, which is the second largest tropical forest on the, uh, in the world and really important for, from the point of view of holding the Earth's uh, carbon resources. And of course, gorillas are what we call an umbrella species. And so if we protect the home and the habitat for gorillas, we also will protect an enormous amount of other biodiversity. And the work that we, the work that we do, importantly, it's all led by local community. The local community sees conservation as part of um, their future and invited Grace to come and build the sanctuary on their site here. And this photo here is from one of the traditional kings in the area, actually laying the first cornerstone for the establishment of the Grace Sanctuary. And over here, you can see our incredible team in Congo. Um, we um, are, all of our initiatives in, um, in Congo are led by our Congolese team. And that's been really important to us over the years um, as we build capacity there. Um, so that our role and our operations can continue even without our presence there in this remote area we really built from, from the ground up the capacity and we were, I, I think it like a, um, a, a cornerstone in our success was getting the GFAS accreditation so that we can get globally recognized in this remote area for the work that our, with our teams do. And that strong relationship with our Congolese te team has also given us incredible insight into what are the real issues facing gorillas, facing uh, gorillas in the wild, and um, how we can go about co-creating together better, better solutions. Um, so, yeah. And so our programs are great. So center around what we call our three different pillars for progress. We have our Grace Sanctuary, which focuses on gorilla rescue, recovery, and release. As we talked about, our conservation education community programs. And what we've turned our attention to more recently is conservation of wild gorillas in the neighboring um, Taina Nature Reserve. And so when you're dealing with a critically endangered population, every individual counts. So every individual that comes into our care at Grace is given the opportunity for manage for rehabilitation, rehabilitation and possible re release to, to the wild to um, aid in the conservation of the gorilla population. And so um, at Grace, well, let's go straight, yeah, meet the 14 gorillas that we have in our care at Grace. We have this uh, um, super um, forest enclosure here of 24 acres in one enclosure, 15 acres in the other. And those, these gorillas have all come into us less than three years of age, often younger than that. They've left their mothers at an age before they would become independent in the wild. And remarkably, they've grown up into this great gorilla family. All 14 gorillas um, are managed as one group right now. And that for us has been a real success on this road to rehabilitation, to be able to form a socially cohesive family group. And it's amazing when you think of the backgrounds of these gorillas that we see the mothering care, we see um, the social relations, we're seeing mating, which is so important for us when we're looking for, for, for release. And that forest enclosure has also allowed the gorillas to learn, self-learn, survival critical skills for release to the world. So we see nest building, we see foraging, we see building strength by climbing trees. Um, so we're really excited by the work that we've been able to achieve in the last uh, 10 years here. And then alongside this work, whilst our focus might be on um, gorillas, conservation education is central to our mission because we understand that gorilla conservation, conservation ultimately lies in the hands of, of local people. And so Grace has education programs with training teachers, engaging school children, working with women's group, and raising awareness through our 
community-wide campaigns on International Women's Day and um, World Gorilla Day uh, to celebrate to celebrate gorillas and share um, pride, empathy, and understanding for the gorillas and their forests. And so whilst Grace has been there for the last 10 years, running the, the sanctuary and the, the gorilla groups been growing and the capacity of our team there has been growing, we've built tremendous strong roots in our community. And we've developed that permanency by being a sanctuary. The fact that we have gorillas that are long lived, decades old, we're gonna be there. And that sense of permanency has really allowed us to develop a, very a great deal of respect and trust from the communities where we're working. It's allowed us to, um, to build capacity in our team, to have strong um, relationships. And when we did a survey with the local community to ask about the benefits of grace, that permanency, the fact that we've stayed when many others have left this remote and insecure part of the world um, has been incredibly important. But it's also given us a responsibility and an imperative and, imperative and a mission to do more. And so more recently, we've turned our attention, building on our base at Grace, to conservation of wild gorillas in the neighboring Taina Nature Reserve. And in 2020, we were able to conduct the first great ape sur survey in this area. And first of all, just confirm that gorillas, chimpanzees, and other biodiversity still exists in this reserve. And then from that, we've been able to build over the last, um, since July last year, almost 12 months, uh, a permanent biomonitoring team that's collecting information about the reserve that we can share with the community that we can use to inform our ongoing conservation strategies. And so through this, um, oh, and here, and then one of the things uh, is camera traps the teams have been putting out. So we were super excited to get this photo in our first round of camera traps. Of, of a not just a gorilla, but a female gorilla with an infant. So that gives us a great deal of hope for the future. And so if we go back to our map here, we can see Grace is uh, here next to the Taina Nature Reserve. And through so through our permanent presence here, we can begin to um, support conservation in Taina. The gorillas that we are caring for, we are planning for release at this site in the Virunga National Park. And as we go forward, we want to maintain the connectivity between the reserve here and the larger Congo, um, Congo Basin to the west. So um, just, just to, to complete that, that permanency of having the sanctuary there has really allowed us to build this mission and vision for supporting conservation um, in this region of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katie. And one thing I don't think you mentioned is that Grace also has a webcam. So you can yeah. actually see these 14 Growers gorillas that Grace cares for in their forest enclosure, sometimes live. I um, will drop a link to it in the chat, but don't watch it yet because we're going to turn to parrots now, uh, hearing from Tanika. Hey everyone, um, bear with us for a second. Our internet just gave us a unstable warning. So if we freeze, just uh, you know, wave your hands or say something, but we'll try and keep on top of it. Um, so bear with me for one second. I also pull up our presentation. I'm gonna share our screen. So you want to let us share? What's happening? Might take it a we little bit. We might of be having time. some technical difficulties. Can you see our screen? Jackie, I do not see it yet. No. Jackie, do you have access to their slides and maybe you can share them? And I was just going to say, um, I can pull up the slide deck. I have to find it. Okay. We, I think we got it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We should be good now. Let's try this again. 
So we're using a different computer than we used last time, so. Okay. No problem. Looks like something's starting to come up. There we go. I see them. Okay, good, good, good. So let's see. All right. So I'm going to hide this. I don't know how much you can see here. Perfect. Looks like we're seeing the full present or the, the presentation, the first slide of your presentation. Okay. Sorry about that. We had to switch computers because it's actually so humid here. My computer, um, it's brain fried. So uh, we're now using Karen's well, computer. No. But yeah, no, it's a, you know, you're the, good now. It's a part of working in the rainforest. Um, so thank you so much for having us here. My name is Danica Oriel Morway. And as they said before, I was the former chief operations officer of foster parrots. I sit on the board um, and I'm still very connected with the organization as well as our conservation efforts. I am here today with my friend and mentor, Karen Windsor, who is a co-founder and executive director of Foster Parrots um, and has been fundamental in establishing our work in Guyana with Sun Parakeets. Uh, today's uh, program is really going to be focusing actually on a partnership. Um, Foster Parrots, as you know, is located in Rhode Island uh, in back in the US, but uh, we partner with organizations all around the world. And today this work is really made possible because of One Earth Conservation um, and a really phenomenal conservationist, uh, Dr. Laura Kim Joyner. Together, our programs have put together Kieze Ariwonga Tuamara, which is actually the Makushi saying for our son pair, keep fly free. And that is our local project in the village of Crossby, where we'll be talking a lot about our work today. Uh, a little bit about One Earth Conservation, and I really can't speak enough about her um, because she's truly an amazing powerhouse of a conservationist and as a person. Uh, One Earth Conservation operates all over South and Central America and are addressing some of the most uh, sort of endangered species when it comes to the parrot world. They are working in areas where there are a handful of birds left and are working under extremely challenging um, circumstances. But her work is rooted in collaboration principles and the idea of working within communities, um, ind indigenous run projects that help liberate people and animals. So a little bit about why Guyana. Um, I wanna sort of also, <laughs> Karen's signaling me because I'll start talking more and more. Yeah. But why are we operating in Guyana? And I, I want to hand this off to Karen Windsor, who's actually fundamental in, in establishing our relationship uh, in Guyana. So if you want to yeah. give a little history. Like just very quickly, foster parrots has always believed that um, parrot rescue and conservation go hand in hand. And we became involved in Guyana in uh, 2005, where we established a um, ecotourism based conservation effort in the village of Nappy. And we did this in order to provide an economic alternative to um, hunting and trapping for the pet trade. Um, and also in exchange for a wildlife protection agreement. Um, and this was um, a very successful um, conservation effort and also one of the first in Guyana. And one of the other most important uh, aspects of our work in Guyana is that Guyana is one of the last two countries in South America that's actively exporting its wildlife and it's still legal. So not only are they extremely biodiverse um, in the habitats and the wildlife that's present there, but they're actively being exported and there's no one really counting a lot of these species. So we have a sort of um, a, a perfect storm developing here where animals are being extracted, but we don't know how many are there, how many are remaining. And then the other part is that they've become almost a way station, a clearinghouse for all other traffic and wildlife in South and Central America are going through both Guyana and Suriname. Uh, so this is a very critical place for us to be operating in. And also for foster parrots, um, it's a very personal work for us. You know, foster parrots is a lifetime sanctuary for unwanted, abused, and abandoned companion parrots uh, back in the U.S. So the reality is these are all relatives of wild animals. These are not a domesticated species. And what I did here is just grab a couple of um, shots from the birds that call foster parrots home. And these are all native species to Guyana. So for us, it really marries that, that sort of um, rallying cry that we have, which is that, you know, no, while we keep birds in cages in our homes, no bird in the wild is actually safe. Because unfortunately what it's doing is creating the illusion of a demand. Meanwhile, foster parrots is turning away between one and three birds every single day who are seeking refuge and sanctuary. Most birds don't stay in their home more than a couple of years. By the time they come to foster parrots, they've been through 10 homes. So we're dealing with an unwanted parrot problem in the US. Meanwhile, their counterparts are going extinct quite literally before our eyes in the wild. 
So today I really want to focus on the sun parakeet because the sun parakeet is a uh, critically endangered parrot. I do want to mention that one out of um, every three parrot species around the world is either threatened, endangered, or critically endangered. And I think this is one of the parts that um, as conservationists, we need to really work on reframing how we look at birds because so many people only think of parrots as companion animals. Meanwhile, they're truly a wild species that we are losing as we speak. I wanted to also talk quickly about um, what's happening to some parakeets back home in the US. These are prolifically bred pet parrot. They're often treated as a sort of introductory parrot because of their small size. But the reality is that this is actually a really uh, intelligent, robust sense being that has one of the loudest sound to body ratios. Um, here's a quick, you know, I did a screenshot of, you know, Googling um, baby sun conures. And here is just what's being sold um, right around, you know, the sanctuary in New England and in the South. I mean, it's, it's just wild. And you can even go into most pet shops in your local towns and find sun parakeets for sale. And you're not going to be told that this is a wild animal. You're not going to be told the, that this, you know, has a 30 plus year lifespan. You're not gonna be told that this is a critically endangered animal in the wild. Um, and this is one of just the biggest tragedies of the pet trade is that we have birds in our homes while they're going extinct in the wild. Um, and here is, I always sort of like to show these, this ju juxtaposition. Um, the biggest misconception about parrots is that they're domesticated. Um, they're not domesticated. They're extremely successful wild animals and all of those instincts are very much still a part of who they are. Um, this is where we see, again, parrots lose their homes because they have adapted to their situation, but they are not tamed. They are not domesticated. Their biological needs are not met in captivity. Their emotional and psychological needs are not met in captivity. Everything that makes them a wonderful wild animal makes them an extremely um, maladaptive pet. And this is where we all need to reframe. Um, and we need to really start thinking about these animals as endangered species, not as a companion parrot, not as a pet. Um, even the ABMA has listed that uh, parrots are the, sorry, second most, the third most popular pet um, in the U.S. behind cats and dogs, if you don't include um, exotic fish. So we have a massive homeless parrot problem, um, and they shouldn't even be in our homes. So where are the birds? Where are we working? Where are we finding them? So we work in Guyana. Um, Guyana is, for those of you that don't know, is in South America. It's directly north of Brazil and surrounded by Venezuela and Suriname. We work in an area called the Rupinini region, which is deep into the interior jungle of Guyana. Our sun parakeet project is in Karasabai, um, and the tribe that's there is the Makushi tribe. We also work in Yupakari and Rewa, where we're doing parrot census counts as well. Our philosophy is that even though we need to address the sun parakeet issue, we need to be counting all the birds. One of the biggest problems with parrots is that there are so few people counting them. It's extremely hard. And we oftentimes don't know that we've lost such a significant amount of a population until they're just gone. And this is what makes all birds extremely vulnerable. What we do know about their range is that they are certainly currently in Guyana um, and they're likely also in Brazil. We work on the border between Brazil, Brazil and Guyana and we're not really sure are we looking at two subspecies? Are we looking at the same population that's moving across the border? Um, you know, this is really just a matter of there's not enough people counting and there's not enough data to be working with. So our efforts really there in trying to come up with the foundational data sets that we can start working and creating really robust conservation work. We have heard reports that they're in Suriname, French Guyana, and Venezuela. We're not seeing it. Um, we've been working in Suriname. Actually, Laura Kim Joyner, who would be giving this present presentation if um, she was able to do so, but she's in a, on her way from Nicaragua to Suriname. And already, um, you know, we, the last time we were there, we didn't find anything. So, um, and here is just a rough, um, you know, I pulled this off of the internet and this is a, giving a rough idea of where their range used to be. Um, and as you can see here in the red area, the sun parakeet used to quite literally span across the center area of Guyana. And now you're seeing that they're sort of pushed a little bit uh, to the south, closer to Brazil. I would say this is an extremely generous um, assumption of their territory at this point. Um, we're not seeing the numbers in Brazil. We're not getting those reports that they've gone in that deeply. So what we think is very possible that it's a much smaller habitat and range that they're staying in now. And this is really like finding a needle in a haystack. And anybody who's a bird or which I'm sure there's some in the group, you understand how hard it can be. But we're working with them, um, trying to find a bird that's no bigger than the size of a cardinal. Um, and they have already, uh, they're gone. And a lot of these areas that we're working on, we rely very heavily on the reports of these communities um, so here, we're, this is actually Laura Kim Joyner, who's speaking with a poacher. And this is, I'd say he's a retired poacher because the sun parakeets are no longer in, in the area that he's living in. 
but he's telling us he grew up in this area um, and when he was a kid, he would see that these birds would cover trees and they would cover the farms and they're just gone. And the poachers are play a really fundamental um, in, is, instrumental role in our work because they're the ones that study these birds, they understand these birds. Um, and he was actually expressing concern that he no longer saw these birds. We also work with farmers. Um, you know, these are people who are in their fields from sunup to sundown. And so they actually get to see the full behavior range of these animals. So they tell us, oh yes, we see them in the morning, go north and then we see them come back, um, you know, around 4 p.m. or so. And this is all part of us putting together a narrative of what are these birds doing? Because when we first arrived in Guyana in 2018, um, looking for the sun parakeets, we had no idea where we were gonna find them. So it was a lot of gathering of information, a lot of sleuthing and a lot of questions. We also really depend on birders. Um, we run into birders all the time. And you know anybody in, in, this, uh, in this community here who is a birder, your work and your knowledge is, is really important to conservationists. Oftentimes um, birders are the ones that, you know, they'll go into the deep areas to try and find these birds. And so we always make sure we're asking them, what have you seen, where are you going, what are you doing, what have you heard? And that, again, that puts all of this into a narrative for us to start saying, okay, we have this entire country, we know that they're in this rough area, now how, how do we find them? So the idea is that we find the birds, we know where they are roughly, now we have to count them, we have to collect the data so we can actually use this externally to get people to pay attention to what's happening. We use a system called a transect count, which generally is about five people that we set out in what we ideally would be a line. Um, oftentimes these habitats are not really uh, conducive to that, but we do the best we can. We place each individual about 175 meters apart. And the idea is that when we see a bird fly over or along, that each person can either corroborate what they saw. And I'll explain a little bit how we put this data together at the end. Here we are doing a river transect count, and we also do this in roads. And again, the idea is trying to find some sort of a sequence where we can equally space people out for the count. Uh, this is us actually doing a ranger training in Karasapai with a bunch of young men um, who are going to be the next generation of uh, nest rangers and protectors. And this is ultimately what we get left with. And, yeah, and, I, and it looks a little rough, but I'm going to explain this. Um, this is a map of flight paths. And sometimes you'll be sitting out there and you'll get two birds. But then you'll be out there and you'll get hundreds of birds. So you're trying to get as much information down as possible, as quickly as possible. And um, when she says birds, she's talking about cross species. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Amazons, macaws, yeah. we're counting all the birds. Yeah, so again, you know, because oftentimes we're not seeing the sun parakeet, uh, but again, we're trying to collect all the information we can on every parrot species that we can identify. And this is ultimately what we get left with. And what we are really trying to look for here is time, species, how high are they flying? What direction are they flying in? Are they flying in pairs? Are they flying in a flock? Are they vocalizing? Are they landing in a tree? Are they leaving the tree? These are all things that tell us a lot about what's happening to these birds. It gives lots of information about what are they adapting to? What is their pattern? So we can better follow them and come back year on year. And at the end of it, this is always the most challenging and probably frustrating part is everyone has to bring all their data together and you have to match it up. So if I can't match up what I saw with one other person, that data point's gotta go. And at the end of it, sometimes you'll have this huge long um, list of data points and you can't use about 50% of it because you can't corroborate with the next person. And the purpose of this is to really have a conservative but really, really reliable set of data because the, the spaces that we're working with, there's so much variable when it comes to the environment, the habitat, that we really need to make sure what we're capturing is accurate to the fullest extent possible. So. What do we know so far? We know that these birds are retreating. They have gone into the woods. They've left, they left their native range, which is generally farmland, generally the savannas, and they're going deep up river into the mountains, into the deep jungle. This is not where they're supposed to be. And what Laura Kim has always explained is you gotta watch what these birds are doing. If they're not doing what you expect, you gotta ask why. It's because these birds are being heavily impacted by people, they're still actively being approached. So they are hiding quite literally. We also know that they are really um, dynamic nest dwellers. They nest communally. So you'll have multiple females and multiple males. They will share roosts, they'll move roosts, they'll move nests. Um, and we don't know what their breeding season is, um, is yet. We do know that there are 16 active cavities, but we don't know how often are they using these cavities, who's in the cavity. Um, so they're this really dynamic um, and really wild. They've got so much personality. It's, uh, they're, they're amazing. Um, 
And what we also know is that there's only about 252 left. And the count we had before this was 400. The count we had before that was about 199. Um, these are not good numbers. Uh, we thought we'd maybe, you know, see up into thousands because that was kind of the, uh, the rough report that was being shared around. And that's simply not true. Um, these birds are losing count rapidly. So conservation, you know, it's a human issue. And I think one of the things that we all need to really think about is that when you talk about conservation, you're not just talking about parrots, you're not just talking about plants, and you're not just talking about people, you're talking about all of it together. Because ultimately, every animal problem, every environmental problem is also a human problem. And a lot of this work, when I said that is rooted in collaboration principles, it's about creating opportunity and lifting up the human condition while you also address the conditions and needs of the habitat and the environment. Here uh, on this gentleman on the left is Davis, who's one of our guides. He's probably one of the most um, phenomenal animal wildlife guides and identifiers we've ever worked with. When he's not working doing the counts with uh, Laura Kim and one of conservation, he's working in gold mines. And the human um, you know, implications of that are catastrophic. It's catastrophic for their environment. And this is where a lot of our work goes into these communities and they're asking, help us create ecotourism, help us create other forms of support for our community so we don't have to keep losing our, our sons to the mines. And that's what's happening. And this is one of um, us getting ready to go upriver looking for the sun parakeets and we're doing another ranger training and these are all young men that have um, aged out of the school system and now are faced with uh, how do I support myself and my family? And, you know, most of these uh, subsistence farmers don't, they're not robust enough for them to be able to support their families anymore. And that's where we're seeing a lot of these young men leaving their villages and going to the mines and they don't want to do this. And this has been a huge part of the um, incentive and support and, and ultimately the ask of let's, you know, help make our animals worth more here than gone so that we can continue to be here and steward our own lands. And this is, um, we always work with the tribal councils, um, you know, working in any of these, these areas, you know, it, this is a partnership and it's a lot about sharing information. And this is a picture of Laura Kim giving a presentation to the tribal council of Rewa Village. And uh, we always show them this picture. And this is one of the moments that I had while working there where you just kind of realize how complex this problem really is. As we show them a picture of uh, Isabella. Isabella is a blue and gold macaw. She's a resident of foster parrots. Now, blue and gold macaws are a huge part of the landscape and the soundscape of Guyana. They are in these villages. I mean, these are animals that these people have, woke, have lived with and grown up with. And when they saw a picture of, of Isabella, they turned to us and said, why do you want our birds then? And it was this profound sadness of realizing that these birds are being taken out of these habitats and these, these communities to go end up like Isabella, somewhere in someone's home, um, unable to survive, um, ripped away from anything familiar and forced to breed in, in situations that are devastating to their biology and ultimately their species. So at the end of all this, um, the, the biggest thing we need to do is really reframe how we look at parrots. Parrots are not pets, and foster parrots has always taken a very strong stance that this is a wild animal and needs to be spoken as such, and not even in the conversation anymore as a companion animal because it's not helping them. Most people have a critically endangered species in their own home, and they don't know that they are going to lose them in the wild. And all I can say is that the work that Laura Kim Joyner is doing, that Wonder Conservation is doing, Macaw Conservation in Costa Rica, here we are is doing in situ conservation. It's going into the communities, it's supporting the indigenous families and in, in villages that are the stu true stewards of these lands and supporting them and helping protect their habitats and their environments. So please, you know, the biggest thing you can do as somebody who's maybe not gonna get to Guyana is to support organizations like Wanna Conservation, like Macaw Conservation. And if you're someone who likes to travel, visit these places, support indigenous run conservation projects, support these eco villages, support these villages that are trying desperately to figure out ways to continue conserving and protecting their lands. So thank you all so much. Um, I tried to run through a whole lot in this and I probably spoke pretty fast, but um, thank you so much for having us and allowing us to talk about these birds that we love so much and desperately don't want to lose. Thank you so much, Janika. We have had three amazing 
uh, presentations. And I know Foster Parrots, as you mentioned, also does uh, work elsewhere outside of Guyana, like in Costa Rica. And I'm just putting that link in the chat if people want to visit the Foster Parrots website and learn a little bit more about the conservation work. Um, I was going to ask each of you how we can take action um, in, you know, in light of Endangered Species Day and raising awareness, but I think you've all addressed that. So I'd encourage people listening to, to donate, to learn more, um, learn how they can make some changes in um, their actions that will help to protect these species. And I don't see any questions in the chat, so I just want to say thank you all of you for taking the time for these presentations and for your work to protect these endangered species. And I'll turn it over to Robin for any last minute uh, housekeeping. <laughs>